So when Adam rebelled, the man became corrupted. And when you read the book of Romans, the Bible says that even creation was subject to what the Bible calls the bondage of corruption. The bondage of corruption. So that which God created and when he had was done creating, he said was good, a virus infiltrated that whole enterprise and man became corrupted. It's on the basis of this that salvation became necessary. So in salvation, you are delivered from that corruption and then you are restored to divine order. You are delivered from that corruption and then you are restored to divine order. This is what the Bible means when Paul was speaking and he said that the spirit of God beareth witness with our spirits that we are sons of God. And on occasion of that testimony, we now have capacity to call God Father. Because when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, what happened to man is that Satan became the spiritual father of man. So you hear Jesus speaking to the Pharisees and he says, you are like your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. So when I see you, when I see your character, when I see the... Um, signs that you portray, I can trace your genealogy. I know who your father is. So because Satan became the spiritual father of man, salvation is described in certain contexts. So Paul will tell us in Colossians that he has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and he has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. So in salvation, fatherhood is restored. In salvation, government is changed. Fatherhood is restored, government is changed because everyone who is born into this realm, because Satan had become the spiritual father of man, invariably Satan also received authority to exact government over man. So anyone that is not born again is under Satan's jurisdiction, under Satan's control, under Satan's dominion. So what God does at salvation is that he delivers you from that control, from that government, and then he brings you on that government. He restores you to divine order. So part of that restoration process is where the refining takes place. There are very theological phrases that are used for that. One of that is what we call sanctification. Sanctification is the process of refining because in sanctification what happens to you theologically is that God is working on you to become more like him. That's the sanctification process. You are being set apart. You are no longer common. And then God is now working great work upon your heart, upon your life, upon your spirit so that you will look like Jesus. The criteria for entering heaven is not the name of your denomination. What is going to guarantee your place in the heavenly realms and in the heavenly courts? What is going to guarantee your throne when will we sit down with Christ to judge nations? What is going to guarantee your place on God's side? It's not the denomination you attended while you were on earth. It is the way you have been molded and shaped to look like Christ. The gate pass for heaven and the gate pass for the new Jerusalem is not titles that were given to you in the earth. The gate pass into the new Jerusalem, where you will take your throne. The Bible says that we will sit with Christ to judge nations. The gate pass is that every man's life will be put side by side with Christ. If you do not look like Christ, you are not qualified for that experience. So Paul will say things like, my little children of whom I travail as in bed until what? Christ be formed in you. So all those symbolisms that we were looking at yesterday, the whole idea of the refining process, because if you look at those symbolisms, you will see the various instruments for refining. Remember that in this conference and in this convention, our emphasis is on one instrument, and we've not gotten there yet. I hope I will get there in the night. I'm just trying to build. There's one instrument, although Pastor Blessing dealt with it in, 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 to a point on, on Friday. I'll just build from there. The instrument we are looking at in this conference is fire. 
But when you look at all the other refining processes, there is wind. Wind is what you use at the threshing floor. Crushing is what you use at the wine press or at the olive press. And this crushing can be with the feet or it can be with other instruments. But when you look at these things carefully, even the refining by fire, if you look at all these refining processes, you will see that the, the activities all point to the same end game. What is the goal of the refining process? Number one is separation. So for instance, when the grain is being threshed at the threshing floor, we want to separate the grain from the shaft. The grain from the shaft. Another thing that happens at the refining place is purification. There is separation, then there is purification. And the purification dimension does not happen at the wine press, it does not happen at the oil press, it does not happen at the threshing floor. The purification dimension is associated with the fire expression of refining. That's when purification takes place. Another dimension of the refining process is that the refining process is, is for revelation. Revelation. That means the true condition of an item or an individual will be hidden to the visible eye until it has been put through a refining process. So you don't know the best of yourself until you, the refiner has decided to sit on your life. The best of what you can be, your possibilities in God, are all trapped in your willingness to go through the refining process. And this is the reason why many people are in church and they are wasting. They're just sitting down, unwilling to go far with God, unwilling to discover their possibilities in God, because they are not willing to go through the process where what it is that they have will now be refined so that it can be a blessing. If it doesn't go through the purification process, God will not allow it to be revealed. Because if it is revealed the way it is, it will contaminate men. So there is separation. And these things I'm explaining to you, I'm using it to explain the Christian life. That's what I'm saying, I'm saying to you. Please stay with me. The first one I said is what? The second one is what? The third one is what? The fourth one is perfection. That's what happens when you go through the refinery. There is separation, there is purification, there is revelation, and then there is perfection. So for you to be qualified for purification, you must first of all come out from amongst them and be what? Separate. Okay, let's establish that in scriptures. Micah chapter 3 and verse 2. Micah chapter 3 and verse 2. My brother that is helping us, I would like to, if you can help me so I don't keep going back to my tablet, if you can. Micah chapter 3, okay, let's use here then. Micah chapter 3 and verse 2. Let's see. Micah. What I want you to see in this verse is how the Lord introduces himself as a refiner. Here it is. Is it chapter 3 I'm looking for? Yes. Was it not Micah? Malachi, sorry. Malachi. I said Mika. Mm -hmm. Malachi, chapter 3 and verse 2. Sorry, I said Mika. Sorry. Malachi, chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire 
and like a launderer's soap. Verse 3 is my emphasis. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify who? The sons of Levi. Not the entire Israel. Are you with me? Because if you look at the way God dealt with Israel, his dealings with Israel are symbolic of the way he deals with humanity. First of all, he called Israel and made him a firstborn among all nations. Even with Israel, he now had to select a specific group of people to become his choice people to do business with him. Out of all the 12 tribes of Israel, he selected Levi. When they were sharing inheritances to everybody, he said, Levi will not have any inheritance because I am their inheritance. My, 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 my best is what I give to Levi. I'm not going to give Levi lands. I'm not going to give them money. I'm not going to give them cattle. I'm not going to give them anything. I'm going to give them myself. And you see, what Satan has done in modern day Christianity is he has reduced the average believer to a member of all the other tribes. The average Christian's primary pursuit in life is how to be comfortable in this realm. So a Christian can go on in life and even if their, their relationship with God is not working, they are not, they are not troubled. If I can still attend church, if I can still speak the Christianese, if I can still look like a Christian and act like everything is well, the average Christian is not trouble. Prayer life can die. Love for God can die. Relationship with God can die. As long as we have the form, we are comfortable. And as long as with that form, the world looks at us and it seems like nothing is missing. With that form, we drive a good car. With that form, our children attend good schools. With that form, we have money. With that form, we can eat. So it now looks as if there is nothing missing, there is nothing broken, everything seems to be going according to plan. Meanwhile, the greatest inheritance for the believer is not a house or a car. Your greatest inheritance is all of God. What salvation made possible for you is not a breakthrough in business. Breakthrough in businesses are good. There's nothing wrong with breaking through. But if that is all your Christian life can produce, your Christian life is beggarly. The greatest blessing a believer has is all of God. That's what God was using the tribe of Levi to model. He said, I will be your inheritance. I, had, I hear preachers now say that uh, um, 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 if, you, if, if all you have is prayer, and you don't have money, you cannot fulfill your destiny. Now, as beautiful as it sounds, and when they say these things, young people in the congregation will shout, hey, go deeper. If, you, if all you have is prayer and you don't have money, you cannot fulfill your destiny. And people say, Kai, deep. The reason you think it is deep is because you don't know what prayer is. You don't know what prayer is. Just go and study the life of Elijah. A man, a man that could raise the dead. A man that could make a barrel of wheat, a busy corn now, not to dry up. Hmm. A man who shot up the heavens for three and a half years. When he was shutting it up, he said, there will not be rain, there will not be sunshine, there will be nothing, and except at my word. He didn't say except Jesus speaks. He didn't say, except I go and pray and ask God. He said, my word. I, God is not even involved in the equation. I'm in charge. Then you think that that man, if he needed a blessing, he would be disabled or incapacitated. It's because we don't know what prayer is. If you know what prayer is, you will find out that a praying man can never be at a disadvantage. A praying man. Never. He won't be blind. He won't be deaf. He won't be confused. He won't be crippled in life. Because when you begin to pray consistently, you'll be making contact with the realm of God.
And the more you make contact with the realm of God, the more God is magnified in your eyes. And if there's ever anything you don't have, you will realize that it's not because God cannot give you. You've met God. You've touched him. You know that he has it within himself to give you anything. If he doesn't give you, it's not because he cannot. It might be that you are in a season of your life that you cannot yet handle the blessing. Because God will never give you a blessing that your character cannot handle. He's more concerned about shaping and building you so that when he puts the blessing upon you, you will not collapse under the weight of it. You know how many men God has trusted with the blessing, whether it's spiritual, whether it is material, and because the gifts of God are irrevocable, they have gone on to grow in that blessing and in that gift, and they have used the gift to abuse the body. So they are still in the pulpit, they are still doing ministry, but God has departed long ago. And you know the thing about that thing is, when you, when you plug iron to iron a shirt, if NEPA or PACN or BEDC takes the light in between, the iron will still be hot. It is after a while that people will now find out. Say, Ooh, this is not the iron shirt again. So there are many that are still jumping around and doing everything. And meanwhile, the Lord has departed. So your prize on the, on the path of spiritual progress Money is good. This conference costs money. We need money to do ministry. I got an SOS Macedonian call from Uganda. Sir, we've been following you. Come to us, please. Come to us. We are begging. Come to us. So I went to meet a missionary organization. I said, I know you people used to travel. How, how, how much do I need? Bearest minimum to enter into Uganda and go to so, 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 so villages. They did calculation. Five million. That is minimum comfort. We will trek some places like this. For two hours, we will trek. Minimum comfort. Money is good. But you see, if all you have is money and you don't know God, your life is a waste. So with Levi, God was trying to model to us that the journey of the Christian faith you, you, you only celebrate it as a success if you can apprehend God. God is the prize of the believer. That's why where we read yesterday, Paul was saying that, I know whom I have believed. I know him. What I know about him is not just what I heard from the mouth of a preacher. I met him. I contacted him. I know him. Look at what the Bible says. It says, my sheep know my voice. My sheep hear my voice. The voice of a stranger, they will not follow. So the prize for the Christian is all of God. And you see me, I have made up my mind that before I die, I will find God. Me, I will find him. I've read too many books and listened to too many men speak about God in a certain way. I want to talk about God the way men like Tuza spoke about him. I read Tuza's book and I was damaged for weeks. What kind, how does a man speak about God as if God is in his backyard? Tuza has died since the 1960s. You pick up his book today, it's like it's a fresh manual. A man met God. A man met God. And you see, if your life becomes that kind of life, you will die before men, but what God did with your life will be a ladder for generations. For, for generations. He met God. So when we come to conferences like this, part of what we try to do is to reorder our thinking. That the Christian, our pursuit is not glory in this world. Our pursuit is to become so aligned with God that the riches of his grace can find expression through our lives.